beautiful people everywhere that still decide to join us online instead of in person, but that's okay. Um, as you can see, we are in the old shrine today. Um, the new shrine has some maintenance going on, so we cannot utilize it. But we should be back up and running over there again for our next class. So today we are just going to go over, um, since we've restarted the class a couple months ago, we have been um, going over the Anapanasati Sutra, the Discourse on Mindfulness of Breathing. Um, and I think in last class I decided to stop at exercise four and discontinue the remaining 16 exercises that are in the discourse to move on to um, things that are a little bit more um, compatible for people who may not be Buddhist. So the first four exercises of the 16 exercises are probably the, the, are the foundation of the whole discourse anyway, and they are also the foundation of um, the meditation practice as in general. So the following classes we will, um, the very, the next class, We'll probably focus on the five hindrances of meditation first, since they are the challenges that we face during meditation. Um, and that can pretty much prevent us from having a good meditation session. Um, so the five hindrances are pretty important to know. And the reason I want to start with that first before we continue to other forms of meditation is that so that you are aware of what the hindrances are. So that, that way when we are practicing for future classes and future methods and techniques, that if a hindrance arises, you are at least aware of it and you know what it is and how to counteract it. So um, that way it'll make, a little bit, it'll make things hopefully a little bit easier for you to be more aware, be more mindful of what you're doing and how you're meditating so, you just, so that you have a fuller nicely balanced session <clears throat> and then after the hindrances we'll focus um, on three main main methods of meditation breathing meditation mantra meditation and walking meditation um, and then after that like i mentioned last class we'll focus our main goal for this series this year is to concentrate on something called access concentration which is the super point that our mind needs to be on, be in, in order to have a correct, full, perfect meditation session. An access meditation is the mindset where we are completely at ease, we are mostly thoughtless, we are um, able to concentrate fully, very strongly, with little distraction. We will still have distractions, but like I said, they'll be small, they'll be in the background, kind of wispy and just kind of randomly there, but they won't be too big of a hindrance, hopefully. <clears throat> and then after that, after we've covered that, depending on where we are in the year, um, my hope is to have our next retreat after we've completed the access concentration classes. So it'll probably be around November this year. Um, yeah, around November. So I also want to wait that long so it's not like a bazillion degrees outside. Because as I just spoke to earlier, I want it to be like 60, 70. Okay. So again, I'll just recite the first four practice, uh, first four exercises so that we can do a quick overview. So the exercises from the Anapanasati Sutra, uh, the first exercise is breathing in a long breath. I know I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath. I know I am breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath. I know I am breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath. I know I am breathing out a short breath. Breathing in, I am aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I am aware of my whole body. Breathing in, I calm my whole body. And breathing out, I calm my whole body. So as we've discussed before, these exercises aren't exactly instructions for us to do during meditation, 
they're also not something that we need to forcibly, forcibly do, right? So when we're saying, I'm breathing in a long breath, or I'm breathing in a short breath, you're not controlling your breath and saying, I need to have a long breath or I need to have a short breath. We are simply just being aware of how we are breathing. So the whole focus of meditation, or at least the, the discourse of mindfulness and breathing, is to help us be aware of our mind and our body and to help us see the things that are kind of potentially negative, right? Um, and then help us get rid of things, right? The whole point of meditation is to get rid of, not to gain. We're not gaining peace. We're not gaining happiness. We're not gaining concentration. We are letting go of the hindrances, for instance, right? We're letting go of the anxiety that we have. We're letting go of the, um, the negative mental um, hindrances and the ill will and everything, right? We're getting rid of things. We're not gaining <laughs> anything. We're getting rid of so that we can see fully the things that we're trying to gain, right? So we can't obtain happiness if we're super greedy and ignorant and just hating on the world, right? We can't gain peace if we're constantly struggling with stupid life stuff or stress and anxiety. So we can't gain any of the things that we want to get out of meditation without letting first letting go of other things, right? So this is where the practice comes in, or at least this is where breathing meditation comes in. So as we've, as we've discussed, right? So we're not watching, we're not um, controlling our breath. We're simply just watching the breath. And the focus here or the, or the objective is to really try to see the very subtle changes in our body, in our mind, in our breathing, right? Mind, body, and breath have to work together. They are one, they become one, right? Because as we know, if we are walking from our car to the building, we sit down, right? We are having some body activity. So when we sit down, our breathing is a bit longer than it usually is. It's irregular, it's coarse, it's not steady and slow like it should be, right? So our body is like, hey, I'm a little exhausted right now. We need to slow down, you know, back up, stop running around like a crazy person, just sit <laughs> and relax. So those are the changes we want to be aware of. So when we first sit for meditation, right, we're noticing that our body is a little bit uncomfortable because we're trying to adjust our posture, our breathing's irregular, right? So if we're able to notice these subtle differences, then we'll be more aware of, of, of why those changes happen in the first place, right? So you've sat down, we've calmed the body, we've calmed the mind, and we're in meditation now, and all of a sudden you remember, I don't know, you hear something that reminds you of something negative or someone negative, right? Maybe you hear a dog barking, you're like, oh, that dog barking reminds me of my old boss. I totally hated her. <laughs> I don't know something, right? And so now that negative thought has arise, risen, and thing, subtle change, but subtleness is going to happen all over, right? So your body may start to feel tensed up because now you're angry and you're trying to hold in that desire to just slap something or someone, right? And so you feel your body tensing up. You feel maybe your body's even heating up, right? Because now you're angry. And so it all starts from the body first, right? You can, you can hopefully feel the change. So that's your first... That's your first, um, hey, there's something going on here, kind of note, right? Your natural body, bodily note is like, hey, your body's sensing up. So hopefully, we're able to be aware of that subtle change right then and there. And if we're able to see it and notice it and be aware of it right then and there, then it stops from becoming bigger and going into our mind, right? Even though we have that thought, right, but it's not a fully developed thought yet, right? We just remembered oh, that dog barking reminds me of my old boss. But it's not a full, complete thought yet, right? Because it has to start in your body first and go up. So if you're able to stop it at the body level, then it won't go to the mind level. If it goes to the mind level, level now it starts becoming that fully blown out thought, right? Now you're starting to entertain the thought. You're remembering of all the horrible things she's done and said or hasn't done and said, right? You're just, the whole storyline starts there, right? 
and hopefully you're able to stop it there. But if not, <laughs> then it becomes something bigger, right? And if we if we continue with that storyline and and with that with that habit thinking, then it starts becoming kind of a, it starts conditioning our mind and our thinking, right? So now that every time someone maybe mentions her name or you see her in an email or whatever, your first thought is going to be a negative thought, right? You're going to remember automatically the horrible things that she's done and said. You're not going to remember the potentially good things she's done or said, right? So it creates that habit of every time you see or hear that person, negativity arises, right? And that's what we want to try to avoid is that negativity arising because yeah you may have some negative thoughts and feelings about that person but they not they may not really be that way that's just your subjective um, analysis of that person right that's your own journey with them that's not who they truly are or what they're all about and that's just how you believe and think of that person but they may not be that someone else can be like oh no they're a total saint i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> right so everyone's got everyone's got different opinions and because of that now that they have a positive opinion they have a negative opinion they have a neutral opinion so now who's right who's wrong nobody can be right nobody can be wrong so we want to get out of that subjectivity thinking mindset and and kind of take away the things that create um, create that bias opinion about them, right? So a lot of times, I think I've mentioned this before, a lot of times we have a habit of holding on to first impressions, right? So if a new person comes into work, a new team member, a new boss, whatever it may be, right? And their first impression with you is just, not a very good one right and so we tend to hold on to that for like ever for a very long time maybe eventually it'll change but typically it's gonna be it's gonna be held on to for, with us for quite some time and even though they've done things to completely um, erase that first impression you've had of them you're like, no, I still hate them, <laughs> right? You see all the good they do, you see all the fa fantastic work they do, they do their job well, they treat the people well, right? But you're like, no, I still hate them for no apparent reason. Or maybe there is an apparent reason, but it could be a wrong reason, right? So when we meditate, our objective is to kind of try to catch those opinions that we create, those false perceptions, those ideas, those stories that we give to people and to things. And we want to essentially just dissect them, right? Because we want to avoid adding all our personal feeling and egotistical thinking toward them and really just see them and it what they truly are or what it truly is, right? And so by doing that, hopefully eventually, whenever we see a certain person or go to a certain place or see something, those potentially negative feelings and, and thoughts we've had about them before will automatically come up. Yes, ma'am. When you mentioned about first impression, that's just a good example for the first impression, right? And then a person who maybe had a bad day or just could be depressed or whatever, but every time you see them, they can never make amends to you or however because that's all you see right. even if it's really just living in the past like you're not really in the present moment so every time you're seeing that person and you're thinking what you think about them right. you are actually removing yourself from the present moment and thinking of what happened in the past right you're reliving a, a bad memory over and over and over again and then also isn't it that when you there and you're dissecting that person because what you think about someone else is really what you think about yourself right so when you're dissecting some somebody and you're like when you're meditating isn't it also a chance for you to realize things about yourself like why do i think that like what is going on in my head and where is that coming from like, exactly so you can let go right like past right uh, patterns or behaviors or forgiving somebody who hurts you when you're like eight and that still is like you know 
moving around in your energy field because it hasn't been allowed to be let go to be released. Right. So meditation gives you all of those things. That's why it's mine. It is, yeah. Because, like I've said before, like when you, a part of meditation eventually, not for beginners, but eventually we want to be able to watch our thinking. So that way, if we're watching our thinking, we remove ourselves from the thinking process and just kind of watch it, right? Which is difficult to do because it's hard to think and watch thinking at the same time. But you want to do that so that you can see exactly. And like you said, ask yourself, why am I thinking like that? Where does this come from? Why do I not like this person? Or why do I not like this place? Blah, 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 whatever it is, right? That way, as you do that over time and over many sessions, you, we start creating this pattern, this trend of, of thought processes, right? And you would hopefully get to a point of, of realization where like, oh, this certain place or this certain word or person evokes this type of feeling, right? And so now that you know why and who and where, we can go to that point and either remove it completely from our lives, we can do or do something about it so it doesn't affect us anymore. But otherwise, the first impression thing, yeah, we're just, you're constantly just living in the past. Oh, you called me by the wrong name that first day. I, I, I'm going to call you Sally when you're Karen. <laughs> I don't know, right? So we're constantly living in the past. And that's where... Um, that's where a lot of our like anxiety comes from sometimes, right? Or hate towards something because sometimes it could be environmental. It could be societal, right? We live, we can grow up in a society where, um, or environment where people are just constantly racist or constantly, you know, homophobic or just whatever it may be, right? And so even though um, even though we shouldn't be thinking that way, but we're, our mind is conditioned to think that, right, as we grow. And so if we get to a point where, like, I don't want to think that way anymore, it's not as easy as a click of a button, right? It takes time to remove something that's been conditioned in our brain. So it's the same thing with memories and living in the past, because, like I said before, our mind is obsessed with time. It's obsessed with the past, and it's obsessed with the future. And so when we try to meditate and bring it and focus into the present. It's like, no, 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 what are you doing? That's not what we're supposed to do. That's my job. My job is to <laughs> remind you of that horrible person and to, you know, be anxious about the fake future that hasn't happened yet, right? So we, we, we need to pull those two and bring it into the present. And so that's why when we are trying to, or that's why we live in the past, right? It's like, hey, we're trying to just see them for they are, but then our mind's like, Remember that one time where she like stole your pen, <laughs> right? You walked, you we're walking to like, you know, someone's desk and, and you're like, oh no, no, they stole your pen, you know, turn around and go the other way. So it's difficult to, to remove that habit that, we, that we've, we've had our whole lives. But, um, but the good thing about that though, at least is as we meditate and as we practice meditation and practice being mindful, we can start hopefully realizing that when we are walking to this person's desk and we remember about that thing that we hate about them, <laughs> you know, we can be mindful and aware that that negative thinking is happening. So then we can catch ourselves and be like, no, I shouldn't be thinking this way or whatever it may be, right? Like you're correcting yourself yeah. and you can continue on. And, and that's where hopefully meditation will help people is that way you can see what's happening. You can analyze your thinking, analyze your habits, and really see why and where they come from so that we can either tackle it and eliminate it or fix it or remove it or whatever it may be so we can continue on with our lives. Otherwise, we're gonna hate this person for like the next 20, 30, 50 years because they stole your pen and the fourth grade, <laughs> you know? So that's why being aware of how our thinking works is very important. So that way, outside of meditation, when we are working or anywhere else and something happens, you know, maybe someone pushes you or someone cuts you off on the road, we're not automatically yelling at them or cursing them out, right? <laughs> we're, we're being, we're able to recognize the, 
the um, the life that they have or they're going through, right? Maybe they were rushed into the hospital. Maybe someone died or they need to get to the hospital before someone dies. We don't know their story, right? But what we, typically, but what we habitually do is give people stories. So if someone cuts you off, we're automatically thinking they're a terrible driver. They're inconsiderate of the rest of the world. You hate them. The discourse is trying to teach us to be aware how our body changes according to the feelings or thoughts that arise, how our breathing changes when those feelings and thoughts arise, and how we can start thinking differently, right? Or negatively, or whatever it may be. So as we sit for meditation, hopefully, if I stop talking soon, um, we want to be aware of those changes. So now that we're in the old trine, right? We're all used to some of those nuanced noises that happen, like the dog barking <laughs> or the cars moving. So it's not as quiet as the new shrine. So those are the things you want to be aware of. So if the dog is barking, luckily he's quiet now, but when he does, because he will, when he starts bar barking, We want to be aware of the feelings that, that it's causing us, right? Because if they're barking too much, they're like, oh, they're ruining my meditation session. And now your body's going to try to shift and adjust itself. It's going to tense up because you're annoyed with the noise and your mind starts wandering off and, and disregarding your meditation objective or meditation object. And our meditation object now for these this class at least is just to be mindful of of changes in the body and breath and mind so you can either um, count your breath like we typically do right as you breathe in one breathe out one in two out two up to ten and then you can either start back at one or reverse back from ten to one and then if you were to get distracted or you lost count or something happened then you just want to reset back to one, right? Or you can do the noting, right? So you can just breathe, right? Just so you can note in, out, in, out, and out. And if a thought arises, just note what the thought is, right? So if you hear the sound of the dog, just say sound or dog, right? And move on. If you hear a car, just say car or sound and move on. If the door opens, just say door or sound and move on, right? Whatever it is. We don't want to think too much of it. If you're thinking too much, then it's not a, it's not a real label. Just Give it the first thing that comes to your mind, you label that thing and you move on. And you go back to being aware of your breath. Um, and then noting is another thing that's useful because it's another thing that can help us keep track of what comes up in our mind, right? It can, keep, it can help us create that trend chart and, and to see what how we think when something arises, right? So if you hear a dog bark, I mean, that's, your first thought may not be sound or dog. It can be annoying or hate, right? If you don't like dogs or something. So um, that's, why, that's why we don't want to think too much of it. And you want to kind of give it the first thing that comes up. So if it is something that's other than sound or dog and something like annoyance or frustration or anger, then over time, right, we add those we add those pins to our, our chart and we can see if the chart is going up and down for the hate category or for the light category or for the sound category. And we can see a pattern of what causes us to be distracted or what causes us to get um, out of sync in our meditation. So that's why labeling is probably one of my favorite uh, methods. And it's probably what I do when I'm in a place that's a little bit noisy. Um, because that way, if you're trying to concentrate on breathing in a noisy environment, then you're constantly going to get distracted because of the sounds and the environment. But if you label it and there's enough things to label, then you're pretty focused, right? You're labeling, labeling a lot, but the labeling is your meditation. So you're not exactly distracted. You're just 
I mean, you are distracted, but you're distracted in the right way. <laughs> um, and that's another thing to remember as to if you are distracted while you're meditating, you know, don't get, don't be frustrated. If you recognize that you're distracted, then that's an accomplishment all on its own, right? This is your, this is your time to, to learn your, how your mind works. So if you are being distracted and you're thinking, oh, I'm constantly distracted, you know, a lot of people get discouraged and they think they're not meditating correctly or they don't know how to meditate or there's something wrong with them. But, but really, if you are noticing that you're distracted a lot or you're just constantly going off and zoning out, that on its own is being mindful and aware of the distractions. So that's already an accomplishment. You're already practicing mindfulness by being aware that you're distracted. <laughs> so don't hate on yourself. Um, what we don't want to do is not be mindful that we're distracted, right? Otherwise, then we start entertaining the thought and we create this whole storyline. Next thing you know, it it's like 2025 and we've missed several years of our life because we're not being mindful, <laughs> which probably happened, right? So, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep this class short because I really just wanted to quickly overview the last four or the first four practice uh, exercises of the discourse because um, that'll give us our foundation um, that we'll need to continue on for the next several classes. Um, yeah, the next following one, I'll do the hindrances because I think that'll be pretty beneficial for everybody. Um, if you're unaware of what the hindrances are, the hindrances, like I mentioned, they're the... What's a nice word for it? <laughs> they're the challenges that we face during meditation, right? So the hindrances um, are sensual pleasure, ill will, um, sloth, aversion, and doubt, right? So as we meditate, one of these hindrances will arise, either one at, either separately or several of them together. Um, it doesn't matter. Those are what causes. Those are the distractions. Those are the obstacles that avoid um, us from having a good meditation session or practice. So. As we learn what they are and we know how they are and how they arise and what to do when they arise, it'll help you in the future when we when we practice the other methods of meditation, um, and then eventually get into the the the, the big guns, right? The axis concentration. That's going to be our goal, our objective for this year is to get to that point. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, that way we can, that way when we have our, our, our retreat, um, it won't be so mentally exhausting for a lot of people. Because it's all meditation, right? The retreat is from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we're meditating for at least half of that time. Okay, not really, but the longest meditation session I think we do is like 45 minutes. Um, which isn't that long, I don't think. But for some people, that's like a lifetime. <laughs> but it's not that bad. It's not that bad when you're correctly meditating, right? Um, and I think it's easier when we meditate in a group because you know there's people around doing and going through the exact same thing that you are. So it's a little bit easier to hopefully allow that time to pass. It's group suffering. It's group suffering. <laughs> Group suffering. I like that. I'm gonna start using that. Um, yeah, you're suffering as a group, so it's not just you that's like constantly trying to stay up or stay awake. But it's really not that bad. I don't think. Is it that bad? Did you feel that you're here? No. It's not that bad. And I think it is easier when you are with more people. I think it is easier when you know what you're doing for the most part, right? Because I think everyone in that retreat. The majority of the people in that retreat were beginner meditators, right? So they haven't been practicing for that long, but they know enough to know what to do, right? Yeah, to practice. Right. So. I was a meditator. Day. 
blindly. Right. Right. <laughs> 15 minutes is too long for some people. Um, so, yeah. And if you went to like a real meditation retreat, the typical session is like two or three hours. Yeah, that's that's killer. So um, I didn't want to kill anybody, so I brought it down to 45 minutes. And I think that's our longest session. Um, and our shortest is like 30 minutes or 20 minutes. But it, I mi we mix sitting and walking meditation. So that way <laughs> your mind doesn't die on you, right? So it's very important when we're doing those retreats that we split them up between walking and sitting. So that way, when you do get up and walk, do walk meditation, we're you know getting our blood moving and get our body moving, so it's easier to to stay awake during the sitting sessions. But um, I think we have like three or four um, sitting meditation sessions during the retreat. So that's why I always wait for several several months of these classes before we do a retreat because I want to make sure that people have enough information to know what to do and how to do it and that's why I go over the different methods and different techniques of meditation so that way because breathing or labeling may work for me but it may not work for you right you could you probably do better with walking meditation she probably does better with mantra meditation somebody else's visualization right so we give all these different techniques so that you can find the one that works for you best and you can stick with that until it doesn't work for you because eventually what works for you now may not work for you a year or two later so when we have enough information enough resources of what to do and how to do it it's easier for you like anything else right even at work if we have more re the more resources we have the easier our job is the same thing with meditation the more resources the more methods we know of what to do and how to do it the easier it is for us to actually sit for meditation so i'll stop there because i can go on for five more hours but I won't kill you so we'll stop there so our next class in two weeks in two weeks um, we'll go over the I'm hoping to cover the hindrances at one session it may take two we'll see I always say one and ends up being like two or three because I talk so much but regardless I think it'll, it'll be very beneficial for a lot of people because as we go in deeper into the other methods, um, you'll know hopefully why something or why something is happening and how to correct it, so that you're fully ready to um, do our retreat and to you know write a book or something. I don't know. So we will sit for 20 minutes. Of meditation any questions concerns emotional outbursts I just have one quick question. yes ma'am I'm, I'm not good enough for you I'm, not <laughs> I'm just kidding <laughs> Because if you breathe through the mouth, then you're, pot you're, you're potentially causing your throat to dry up and your mouth to dry up and to get, then you start having, what is it called, chalk mouth or whatever it's called. Um, and then that's a whole distraction on its own because now you're trying to like just re-spit in your own mouth, right, <laughs> to kind of get it moist again. Um, but definitely breathing through your nose is the most beneficial for meditation. If you're do if you're doing like breath exercises, then a combination of nose and mouth breathing is what you want to do. But mm -hmm. when we sit or walk for meditation, it's always better to do it through the nose. I've never I don't think I've ever read or heard anyone say to do it breathe from your mouth. I mean, unless you're taking deep breaths, you want to you breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth that's something but you only do it for like three five breaths you don't do it constantly i don't know 
who told you that? Who were you to read that? Could be. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a breath exercise, not meditation. I mean, maybe it's meditation for him. <laughs> but I don't think breathing through your mouth is beneficial. No, because your mouth is just going to dry up and your throat's going to dry up. So then it's, it's not working. It's right, because it's not natural. We don't naturally breathe through our mouth unless you do. <laughs> Some people do, I guess. But you, you want to do what's natural so it's not more work for your body, mm -hmm. right? So if you're constantly opening your mouth and trying to breathe through your mouth and you're forcing the air to go through your mouth instead of your nose, that's more work than it needs to be. Why are you doing more work? We're not trying to add more. Remember, trying to get rid of. You don't want to add more work to your session. Um, that's just my thoughts and opinions. Again, there's millions, not millions, but there's hundreds of different methods and things to do. It's your job to find which one works best for you. So if breathing through your mouth works for you, go for it. I'm not gonna stop you, but I'm letting you know my experience and what will potentially happen is chalk mouth. <laughs> Right? That's what it's called, right? Chalk mouth? I feel like there's something else. I know what you're talking about. Ah, I feel like I... It's dry mouth. Oh, man. It's like on a label, like when you go to the pharmacy and like you buy the stuff to like make your mouth water, it's like on the box and I can't think of it. Ugh, and now it's going to drive me. That's what I'm thinking about now in my meditation. That's <laughs> what it's called. Oh, I don't care about it. Okay, so 20 minutes, and then afterward we can um, share some experiences.
session. zone out. Wow. Yeah. That's what you said to me earlier. Yeah. Yeah. The having the group you were was amazing experience. I'm yeah. telling you, group sessions can make a huge difference. I think it's like one of the most difficult things to do. It's much easier. I don't know why. It's just the group energy. Like even myself, like in the morning, we meditate 90 minutes every morning when we wake up to do our chanting and stuff. And sometimes it literally just feels like forever. But when we're doing it in during a retreat or with more people, it's so much easier. I don't know why. Sit. I miss having the clock during meditation because in the new building it's just complete silence <laughs> it's dead like there's not even eight the ac is not on for for the ac sound like it's just completely silent so now that i have the clock i use the ticking clock method for my meditation and just meditation just goes by i love the clock Well, that's one of the hindrances that we'll go over next time. The sloth and torpor and laziness. I love sloths too. They hurt though. Have you hold it, held a sloth before? Oh my goodness. I saw the scar on my arm when they scratched you. Yeah, because her claws were like five inches. That's ridiculous, but they're so cute. Um, yeah, laziness or tiredness is one of the hindrances. So we'll find out how to unsloth ourselves <laughs> next time. Wow. Unsloth. Is that a word? Probably not. Unsloth. Is it a word? You're the writer. You can make anything up. That's so weird how that works. Which is also weird because every word is a made up word, technically. Right, exactly. So to like make a word that's not a word, it's like, no. So unofficially, dictionary wise, it's probably not a word. Right. It should be the same. Right? If the word dope can be it, then. We're going yeah, to unsloth ourselves. Yeah. Unsloth ourselves. I think you should make that the first aversion because I would like to know. Sneak peek, that's because you're not focusing hard enough. On my breathing? Yeah. But I can hear it in there. Well, it's not just breathing, trying. then you move to something else. Like focusing hard. Well, I was focusing on, then I started to focus on my stomach going up and down because that's part of the breathing, right? Because right. I'm sleepy. That's true. I get really relaxed, like really. Like every time you hit the bell at the end, it's like a start of a new day. Like that's, <laughs> that's like where I'm that's at. That's a. The fibrillator is that what's called? Yeah, it's just like you this Bring it back in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We concentration is the antidote. I mean, is the cause of sloth. We concentration. Weak concentration. Or weak focus or awareness. Because think about it. Like if you. Because naturally our bodies will just become very slothful when we're resting and not doing anything right like when we're bored we're pretty for the most part we're tired when we're bored um or we're like uncomfortable right and if we sit down for long enough doing nothing then we're 
naturally would probably take a nap or fall asleep, right? Because our minds are not mentally challenged. But when you're working or when you're working out or you're doing something that's taking your focus away from not doing anything to doing something, then you don't feel the tiredness. You don't feel slothy, <laughs> right? So you have more energy during doing that even when reading or working at the office or at the desk, we're doing something that's giving us the energy to continue. So when we're not doing anything, especially when you're, when you're meditating, we're obviously not doing anything, but we are, the, the, the battery that's giving us to continue is our awareness and our concentration. And so if our awareness and concentration is weak or non-existent, then we have nothing to, fuel our battery. I'll go more into it when we get to it. Yes, but please. Yes, I was like, yeah, I'll be waiting on this stuff, but I feel it's getting pretty sleepy. Because one unorthodox way of getting out of that is to um, deliberately distract yourself. It's like the last resort. Like I, you'll almost never hear me say that, but <laughs> sometimes, especially when we have um, like overnight retreats or like weekend retreats or something where people are here living with us, living the monastic life with us and meditating for as long as we are, um, who are used to meditating for five hours a day, um, they're naturally going to be like just dozing off. So one very un conventional method is to deliberately distract yourself because if we're distracted and we're playing with entertaining a thought then that's keeping our, our our mind active and we're not feeling the drowsiness so it's very unconventional it's dangerous because you can get into it and not be able to get out of it you, you forget you're in meditation because you're so in zone with whatever thought you're entertaining. That's why I don't recommend it because it's very difficult to get out of it once it's started. But that's a very last resort. <laughs> but we'll go over obviously in the, 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 the with the traditional methods of how to um, the traditional antidotes is what they call it for the hindrances. They're mostly common sense stuff in some practice obviously but that's why I want to introduce them early on so that later on when we do other methods and eventually get to the retreat, you know what to do when you're about to crash. Because this is 20 minutes, right? Our retreats are 45 minute sessions. So <laughs> it's double the amount of time. And if you're, if you're already asleep halfway through, then what are you doing there? Why are you meditating? Be surprised. I would have to be, and I would be sleepy before the night, but <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like tired, tired. I know I haven't get tired today, but I'm just saying in general. For me, it's probably sleep. And I think that's just me being so tired. Oh, tired and tired and sick. I could probably sleep. I have fallen asleep. <laughs> it happens. It happens. But, okay. Any other last thoughts? Opinions, questions. Talk what? You mentioned about meditation being, it's about letting it go. Do you have anything? I don't, I don't have any thoughts on meditation. I asked you about hatred. And you were like, you're like blind because you're like to release energy. Which is like letting go, right? So we're like, I said that. Right, right. So let go. I think so. I'm vaguely recalling that conversation. It was in the new shrine, right? Yeah. But we don't. We don't. You don't mention energy because you love energy. We don't know because mudras are not really. Our, it's. It's yogi stuff, but it's also Buddhist in certain traditions, like the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they're heavy on mudras and they do it through the practices. 
even in our tradition, we do them very, we don't do them very often. It's very, very rare that it has to be a very specific type of ritual or, or, or ceremony that's done in, usually for like weddings or blessings or when we shave our heads for coming into the monastery. But it's outside of meditation. It's, it's done for a specific purpose or ceremony but we don't do it in meditation because otherwise if you focus too heavily on a mudra and how your hand is and what it's doing then you're that's you're taking away focus. your yeah your focus and your and your deter, and your goal of meditation because now you're thinking oh is my hand in the right position am i doing it right am i releasing the energy that's supposed to be going out there and that's not the point of meditation the point meditation is not about where your hands is or where your body is is about where your mind you're taming your mind you're not taming your body so in meditation we always say you can meditate doing anything anywhere you can meditate laying on the floor you can meditate standing up you can meditate standing on your head <laughs> right you can meditate any way you want how your body is isn't meditation it's your mind that's the meditation you're calming your mind you're you're, you're learning to control and train your mind not control and train your body so if you focus so much on mudras or where your hand is, or how your posture is, then what are you meditating? Why are you meditating? If you're worried about how your posture is or mudra is, then go take a yoga class. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Fall, fall, falls Fall asleep. asleep. Mine fell asleep yeah. hardcore today. It's yeah. gone now, but yeah. it did. But I'm not better at it because I practice more at home. Right. Right, but you know, you know, I used to go over like your shoulders, and right? This, so you can feel your breathing and all that, whatever. And then people get like in the beginning, people me, I'm talking about me, I was getting very caught up in like making sure like oh, my back is not straight or whatever, or uh, is my shoulders right? I don't want to get fatigued. Right. So I want to make it the whole 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the sitting posture is important because you have to make sure that you're not slouching too much, right? Because otherwise you're going to have back pain. You're constricting your lungs, so your breathing is going to be abnormal, right? And you start becoming uncomfortable and achy. So the sitting posture is important as far as, far as your session is. Mm -hmm. But the mudra part is not hand placement is not important. You can be meditating like this if you want. <laughs> right. But yeah, sitting posture is is important. Because you have to be, because if your body is comfortable, your mind is comfortable, and your breathing is comfortable, if your body is aching, right, that's a distraction. You're like, oh, my back hurts now, or my leg is numb, or my head is all whatever. I don't know. <laughs> right? So you have to be able to make sure that your body is comfortable so that you can comfortably meditate for the whole session. Otherwise, if your back's hurting and your leg's numb, that's all you're gonna be thinking of is, oh my God, my foot is killing me right now. And what I would tell you, suck it up. <laughs> right, because that's the only way you're gonna be able to get past the legs falling asleep is to work through it. But, it can get to a point where it's just too much and you have to correct your posture or move, which is fine, right? Just be mindful. If, you're, if you find yourself you having to sit up straight or adjust your posture or your legs, your hands, just be mindful of it. That's the whole point is just to be mindful of what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. Otherwise, you're just going to be nonchalantly moving around and daydreaming about something and you forget about the whole reason you're here. Mm -hmm. This question came to me as I was meditating for the first time. Oh, so you were not meditating correctly then. <laughs> as I was going to sleep, it popped in my head. As you were falling asleep. Well, let's not fall asleep. Um,
Um, man, I just realized there's no clock in the new shrine, so I was going to use that method as one of the exercises. I guess I could put a clock in there. What was it called? Metronome. Metronome, that's right. Oh yeah, there's an app for that. There's an app for that, obviously. There's an app for everything. Um, yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah. That's probably my favorite. I don't know, you don't know what we're talking about? You should tell them about the clock method. You can teach them later. It's very effective. I think it was. That was like what the third or fourth class. I think so. Last year, because twenty twenty doesn't exist, so last year was twenty nineteen. I deleted twenty twenty from my mind. It never happened. Um, I think it's recorded. I think the only ones that it wasn't recorded was the very first class, maybe the second class too, because. Apparently, I wasn't technically sufficient, efficient, savvy, and being able to uh, know how to record. <laughs> um, it's recorded, I'm pretty sure. I'm like 90% sure. But it's there. Regardless, we'll go over it again anyway. Um, three classes, two classes from now. Not with two classes from now? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. We'll see, because we all know things change. All right, no more of the questions, concerns, emotional outbursts. Okay, thank you. Namo Shakyamuni Buddha.